Before we get into the stories, I'm excited to announce I have a new channel called Monster Trail Cams. Here's a quick trailer for my new channel. The link is below. Monster Trail Cams is your ticket to the unseen and supernatural. Sourced from a vast network of mystery hunters worldwide, our channel reveals a collection of strange creatures and supernatural events that will leave you on the edge of your seat. From shadowy figures lurking in dense forests to inexplicable entities prowling under the cloak of night, each chilling clip peels back another layer of the world's untold mysteries. We release new episodes several times a week. Okay, now let's get to the stories. I'd hear from my co-workers about strange things they'd encounter, everything from weird lights in the sky to sightings of unknown creatures and even bizarre phenomena that defy physics. I never believed in that kind of stuff, so I didn't take it seriously, but my co-workers would laugh at me and said to give it time. Well, it didn't take long to change my mind. About a month into the job, I assisted with the rescue of a hiking group near Horseshoe Mesa. One of the hikers broke her ankle and needed to be airlifted via helicopter. The group was terrified and told us about something they'd seen up on a ridge. They said it was pretty far away, and at first they thought it was a mountain lion. But then, it stood up on its hind legs, and it became clear the animal had no fur when the sun glistened on its smooth skin. One of the hikers took pictures and recorded video. When I looked at it, I had to hold in my laughter because it was typically out of focus and could have been anything. One picture was zoomed in blurry and indistinguishable, but I have to admit you could make out two piercing yellow eyes, which seemed strange. Whatever it was, they said it looked in their direction and quickly disappeared. They didn't think much of it until later when they heard weird chittering sounds echoing in the canyon around them. They looked up and saw not one but three of those creatures on a nearby ridge, looking down at them. They were closer this time and were able to get a better look. The hikers claimed they were lizard-like creatures, unlike any animal they had ever seen. They were humanoid, but the head resembled a dinosaur, like the Velociraptor in Jurassic Park. And they had those unmistakable yellow eyes. The hikers said at that point, it was time to head back. The chittering sounds continued and they were convinced the creatures were following them. They couldn't see them, but they definitely heard them. As they hiked up the trail, the sounds got louder and they were suddenly pelted with rocks. The group hurried as fast as they could, but the trail was pretty narrow. That's when one of the girls slipped on some rocks and broke her ankle. She was lucky she didn't tumble off the ledge. Someone else hiked a bit further and was able to make a cell phone call while the rest of the group waited with their injured friend. Luckily for them, the chittering sound stopped and the creatures were never seen again. They had all kinds of crazy theories as to what the creatures were. One thought they were aliens, while another thought they were evolved dinosaurs that lived underground in the caves and abandoned copper mines. I wasn't sure what to believe, but I convinced myself that it was a mountain lion, even though the blurry pictures didn't resemble anything of the sort. As far as I was concerned, if there wasn't clear proof, then I would go with the most logical explanation. About a week later, I patrolled the Grandview Trail and made my way to the Horseshoe Mesa. There was no one around that day, so I took my time and enjoyed the awe-inspiring scenery. It's called the Grandview Trail for a reason. As I hiked along, I thought back to those folks we rescued the week before. To be honest, I volunteered to patrol this particular area because I was curious and hoped to see the lizard creatures they described. I wanted definitive proof, one way or the other. You know the old saying, be careful what you wish for because you just might get it? Yeah, that was me. As I got closer to the Horseshoe Mesa, I heard strange chittering sounds. I looked around and thought I saw two figures crouching on a nearby ridgeline. It was too far to get a good look, so I pulled out my binoculars. When I finally pulled them into focus, the binoculars fell from my hands and I uttered, Oh, fudge! So loud it echoed all around me. And to be clear, fudge wasn't really what I said. It was the other F word. Everything felt surreal in that moment, and it took time for what I had seen to register in my brain. It was just as the hikers said. They were humanoid creatures with dinosaur-like heads. 
and those piercing yellow eyes, I'll never forget it, they were so otherworldly. I felt my heartbeat race and I started back up the trail. The chittering became louder and I felt rocks hitting me. I looked up to see three more of those things on a ridgeline directly above. I quickened my pace and didn't look back. At some point, they stopped pursuing me. I don't know when exactly, because I didn't stop until I got back to my truck. The feeling I got was that the creatures weren't happy with people coming around their territory. There were several of them, and I don't even want to think about what would have happened if they all jumped on me and attacked. It was more like they were trying to scare me off. Well, it worked. I rushed back to the ranger station and told everyone what I had just experienced. I must have sounded like a raving lunatic. When I finished, my co-workers just laughed at me and said, Welcome to the club. I never did see those lizard creatures again, nor have I heard any reports of them. However, I've seen other strange things, and I've come to realize there's a hidden world here in the Grand Canyon, one that we've only scratched the surface of. I grew up around Point Pleasant. As a kid, the Mothman was ubiquitous. Everyone had a story. Relatives, neighbors, friends, brothers, roommates, you get the idea. Just hearing about it always gave me the chills. My parents divorced when I was young, and me and my mom eventually moved out of Point Pleasant. I was an only child, and I'd spend the summers with my dad. I loved him, but I didn't feel like I connected with him back then. He used to take me camping a lot. He was an outdoorsman and he loved introducing me to the beauty of nature. It was okay, but honestly I would have rather watched movies or played video games. During one of our trips, I wandered from our site to gather wood for a fire. The sun had already gone down and it was getting dark pretty quick. I wandered a bit too far and as I looked around, I didn't see my dad or our tent. That's when I heard a strange clicking sound coming from up in the trees. I looked up and froze, dropping the sticks in my hands. A shadowy figure was perched high in the branches, maybe twenty feet up. Two glowing red eyes pierced the darkness, staring at me. They were big and round, and I remember being held under their spell, like I was hypnotized. I was convinced it was the Mothman. The branches creaked as the creature stood up and spread its massive wings. It swooped down from the tree, shrieking. I ducked and covered my eyes and felt a gust of wind as it skimmed over me. I stayed curled up in a ball, screaming, until I felt my dad pick me up and hug me. I said it was the Mothman as I sobbed uncontrollably. He calmed me down, and we walked back to our tent where he cooked us a dinner of hot dogs and canned beans. We ate in silence, and he could tell I was still bothered by the experience. We heard an owl in the trees and he said that a lot of times owls are mistaken for the Mothman. He took out a flashlight and shined it around the trees, trying to find the owl. Sure enough, he caught it, and its eyes reflected an orange-red glow. The owl flew off after being identified, but I was sure the creature I saw was much bigger. I asked him what the Mothman was. He thought for a moment, then said it was a force of nature that we just don't understand. But it shouldn't be feared. Instead, it should be revered and respected. I had never heard the Mothman described in that way, and I asked him if he ever saw it himself. He paused thoughtfully, smiled, and shook his head no. Normally after dinner we'd stargaze and my dad would point out the constellations, but I just went in the tent and tried to go to sleep. That night, I had a horrible dream with vivid imagery of fire, broken glass, and twisted metal. At the time, I had no idea what it meant, but it was so real I woke up screaming. Once again, my dad had to calm me down. When I told him about my dream, he gave me a strange look. We weren't scheduled to leave until the following afternoon, but I was so unnerved, I begged to go home early. My dad was a good sport and didn't complain. As we packed our stuff, I felt guilty and apologized for ruining the trip. He reassured me that everything would be okay and that we'd make up for it with a movie night. As soon as we got onto Route 62, I felt much better. The next day, we were watching TV in the afternoon and a breaking news story interrupted the program. Apparently, there was a major pileup on Route 62 after a big rig overturned. 
Several cars were involved, and there were fatalities. It snarled traffic in both directions for hours. My dad commented that it happened on the same route we took home. If we stuck to our schedule and left the campground when we were originally supposed to, we very well could have been involved with that accident. He continued watching the news in silence before finally turning to me and admitting that he did see the Mothman once when he was in high school. At least he thought he did. He and some friends were driving along Route 62 one night, drag racing. He knew it was a stupid thing to do, but they were just teenagers. Suddenly, a winged creature started following them. No matter how fast they drove, it easily kept up. He said it was dark and he couldn't make out its features, but he never forgot its large, red, glowing eyes. He and his friends slowed down and the creature disappeared. That night, he had a dream exactly like the one I had. He thought it was a warning and vowed never to race again. Unfortunately, his friend died in a car wreck a few weeks later while drag racing. One of the things you hear about the Mothman is that he's a harbinger of doom. Like the infamous Silver Bridge collapse in 1967 that more or less introduced him to the zeitgeist. While some blamed him for that event and other tragedies over the years, my dad believed that the Mothman was just an omen. How you interpret it is entirely up to you. I know some will say he's evil personified, a servant of the devil, or something like that. I don't think he's either good or evil. He just is. He doesn't pick sides. But if you see him, set aside your fear and pay attention to what he's trying to tell you. I don't know what I actually saw that night in the forest. It was dark and my overactive kid imagination immediately saw a monster. But like my dad said, and even proved, it could have been an owl. I can't help but think that the sighting in my dream were the Mothman trying to warn me, just like he warned my dad. I wondered how many other people he appeared to and how many of them listened. The relationship between me and my dad changed that summer. We became closer. I guess sharing bizarre experiences will do that. I haven't seen the Mothman since, but I haven't been afraid either. My dad is old now and we don't go camping like we used to, but I cherish every moment with him. In some way, the Mothman taught me that. Life is fleeting and never take it for granted. I'm a Pittsburgh native and I have a story that I think you'll be interested in. So I work at the local children's museum as an educator. I put on programs for the kids, craft demonstrations, and things like that. It's pretty fun. I spend a lot of my working hours interacting with children under the age of 10. I started noticing things because the kids were acting weird. I had a group of preschoolers for one of our hour-long workshops. I couldn't keep their attention, which happens sometimes, not very often, but it happens. What concerned me this time was that they all kept huddling in the same corner of the room. They faced the wall and would just flail their arms around, like they were waving to someone I couldn't see. I was worried that some of the smaller kids could get hurt, so I went to break them up. When I got in that corner, I felt a chill pass through me. I assumed it was an overhead draft or something, and figured I would tell my manager later. But the thing is, I had several lessons in that exhibition area, and each time, the same thing would happen. The kids would all choose the same corner to pack into and they'd start waving and trying to climb up the walls. Whenever I tried to move them, I felt a blast of cold come out of nowhere. It creeped me out, to be honest. And again, I work with really little kids. They're hard enough to wrangle on a good day. I finally asked one of the six-year-olds what game they were playing. She said it wasn't a game. They just wanted to play with the lady in the corner. And this threw me off, because aside from myself and my aide, there were no other adults in the room. I asked her if she could describe this lady, or if she had a name. I thought it was a simple enough question. The girl said she didn't have a name, and that her skin was gray. That was all she could tell me. So I played along just to get through the workshop. My aide wanted to tell our boss about it, or even the parents, but I wasn't convinced it was that bad. It's not like the kids were hurting each other or damaging anything. 
I honestly think I would have kept ignoring it if things had stayed that way. But then we had an incident. I was keeping my eye on one of the boys because he had gone into the corner with the other kids and was acting sort of jumpy. I thought he might have been getting overwhelmed. I was just about to pull him aside when he slid backwards across the floor. It was like someone had grabbed the back of his shirt and dragged him along. The boy was giggling, but I was terrified. An invisible hand had just pulled him clear across the room. There was no ignoring that. Plus, my aide had seen it too. He looked just as scared as I was, which made me feel better honestly, otherwise I would have thought I'd gone crazy for a second. I took the boy out of the room and looked him over. He seemed fine, and it's not like I could take him to my supervisor as proof the place was haunted. So instead, I marched him over to a different activity group. I told one of the other educators that he wasn't fitting in with my group of kids, and she accepted that explanation. Easy which left me the task of figuring out how to corral a group of kids away from the ghost in the room. It was my aide that started to call the thing a ghost. I didn't want to think about being in the room with someone's dead spirit. The only solution I could come up with was sectioning off that corner of the room with a bunch of tables and chairs. I told the kids it was a fort and that anyone who got through the rest of the workshop without disturbing it would get a sticker. Thankfully, that was enough to get them to listen. I wish I'd thought of that earlier. Anyway, me and my aide got through the rest of the lesson without incident. We got our next batch of kids and kept the fort up. There wasn't much time for us to discuss what had happened until the end of the day. We were one of the last couple of people to finish up, and we had to do a sweep of the building. We debated whether to tell our supervisor, or if there was even a way to explain it. I figured that I had been willing to brush it off until I saw something truly strange. Why would our boss be any different? He admitted that I had a point. And it wasn't like we could close off that exhibition area. It was one of our largest rooms. When we circled back to the room and started to take down the fort, I felt that chill again. It made me more anxious than it had before. I just wanted to pack up and leave. I was scared of what would happen if the thing tried to grab me. I was trying to work as quickly as possible and all of a sudden I couldn't move. I was just standing there shivering, locked into a standing position. I don't know why. I tried to raise my arms or call for my aid across the room, but I couldn't. It was like someone else had locked down my body. I was frozen like that for at least a minute before I could move again. My heart rate was going crazy. I bolted to the front of the building and stayed there until my aide finished cleaning up. It was hard to come into work the next day. But I think the spirit left. The kids went back to normal. There was no more huddling. I hope the ghost stays gone. Although I am worried that it's just waiting for another dull moment or went looking for someone else to freak out. I always thought that the stories that people shared about their scary stories were a lie. My younger cousin watches a channel like that, and I used to overhear the stories while babysitting him. I'd be trying to do algebra or something, and in the background I could hear what I thought were fake stories coming from the other room. Well, the joke is on me now because I believe them all now. I had my own terrifying encounter and now feel like an idiot. And now here I'm the one writing in about my experience, which is real, it legit happened to me. I just got my driver's license a few months ago. That's why I was able to babysit my cousin because my parents didn't have to work it into their schedule to drop me off anymore. Technically, I'm not supposed to drive past 10 in the evening, but my parents didn't care and I figured no policeman would ever care. I was coming back from a school choir concert that my friends were in. We got McDonald's afterwards and it was way past 10 o'clock by the time I was heading home, like almost midnight. I had just dropped off another friend whose house I had never been to before, but I was uber confident telling them it was no problem when in fact I wasn't sure how to get home from their house. Well, it turns out I didn't know the way and I got lost. I felt really dumb getting lost, but that's what happened. I took a wrong turn somewhere and ended up on this really long road that took me out into the country. 
I looked for a driveway to turn around in, but it was nothing but a long, straight road with a big dip along each side, I guess to catch the water runoff or something. There were also some trees on either side and some farmland, but not much other than that. So I was driving and getting more and more nervous. And that's when things got really scary. I saw a light coming down the road towards me and thought it was just another car. Sure, I thought it was a little weird that the headlights were blue, but I didn't really think much of it. Some of the hot rod guys at my school had switched out their headlights to have cool colors, so I thought it was odd, but probably just one of those guys. As the light got closer and closer, things were definitely getting weirder and weirder. I could now see that there were a lot of lights all in a row. Cars only have like what, two or four headlights? But this had 12 lights on it, all in a row. And they were all blue and really intensely bright. It also seemed like the lights were approaching way faster than they should have been. So now I'm thinking it was probably just some reckless driver going faster than they should be. It was just approaching so fast that it gave me the feeling like it was moving 100 miles per hour. The lights got closer, and I now started to freak out because I was positive they were in my lane, like coming straight at me. I was pretty sure I was about to get hit head-on by this gearhead idiot having a joy. I wanted to swerve off to the side, but I couldn't get myself to do it. Just when I thought I was going to collide with the other vehicle with these 12 headlights, I made the decision to go ahead and swerve into the ditch. But right before I swerved, the 12 headlights lifted off the ground. Legit, they rocketed straight up into the air and flew right above my car. My car has a moonroof, so I could kind of see it above me for an extra second. Obviously, what I almost hit was not another car, because it was now flying and had made a crazy maneuver in order to not hit me. It must have moved at a pure right angle because I'm positive I was just a few feet from it before it shot upwards. Because I was so close, I could tell that it was really big, and that's why there were so many lights. I couldn't really make out the shape of it because it was dark and basically a shadow. It was just big and dark and lit up by that row of blue lights. That's all I could really see. I sat in my car with it in park for what was probably less than a minute but felt like an eternity. My heart was ready to pound through my chest and I was having to calm my breathing. I made some tight turns on the dirt road to turn basically about a seven point turn and reversed my direction. Somehow I eventually found my home from there. The entire drive back, I was just watching all around for those headlights. I didn't see anything, though. Once home, I immediately tried to look it up on the Internet. Some people think that the U.S. military has drones or spy planes or something, and that's what people see. I'm not so sure about that. This craft or spaceship or drone or whatever moved like no human aircraft possible could. I'm not an expert, but I don't know how a human aircraft could have moved in a right angle like that thing did to avoid me. So that's my story. Like I said, I thought this stuff was all fake and then I experienced it for myself. At the very least, it was all really weird and I have no clue what I saw. I'm just telling myself that it was a super fancy drone because if it wasn't, that really leads me to question a lot of what I thought I knew about the world. My life completely changed and essentially all came crashing down the year I went camping for a few days in Yosemite. It was late May of 2008, and I was feeling depressed. I had just broken up with my girlfriend and basically felt like I was at the end of my rope. So I decided to go on a road trip from San Francisco all the way to Yosemite National Park, which was essentially a 200-mile drive straight east. If you've never been there, Yosemite is quite literally in the middle of nowhere. There are no cities within miles of it, and basically only one main road that leads into and out of it. I arrived around noon on a Saturday and immediately set up camp in the Upper Pines campground. I had all of the stuff I needed and was ready to relax for the next two days before going back home on Monday. The campground was pretty empty, maybe about 10 or 15 other campsites were occupied. I started a small fire and began cooking lunch when I noticed a young couple setting up a tent about 50 yards from me. As I ate my food, an older couple with two dogs arrived and set up camp right next to me. 
They seemed nice enough, so we exchanged pleasantries as they unpacked their stuff. After they finished, I watched as they walked over to the trail to start hiking. I finished eating and decided to take a walk myself. I walked along the trail for about 10 minutes, taking in the sights when I saw something odd off in the distance. It looked like something standing on top of one of the rock formations that jutted out from the ground. At first, I thought it was just an optical illusion because it was so far away and in a place that would be nearly impossible to get to. But as I continued to look at it, it seemed to be moving closer and further away. It also looked like whatever it was stood on two legs instead of four like an animal would. Whatever this thing was disappeared behind another rock formation, reappeared again, and then disappeared completely. This made me incredibly curious, so I decided to speed up my pace towards it. I got closer in about ten minutes and looked towards where I had seen it, but saw nothing. It was at this point that I realized how quiet it was all around me. Usually when you're in nature you hear birds chirping or the wind blowing through the trees, but it was completely silent here except for my own breathing. I decided to continue walking down the trail and see if I could find whatever this thing was, so I kept going until the trail ended and opened up into a clearing with another trail branching off to the right. I'm pretty sure I had seen the couple from before going that way. As soon as I took a few steps onto this new trail, I heard something slam on the ground behind me, like a rock being thrown. I turned around immediately and scanned my surroundings but didn't see anything out of place. No branches moved or leaves rustled. Nothing was moving. After a few seconds, I decided to keep going and see if whatever it was I had seen before had followed me. I didn't see anything, so I kept walking for about five minutes when I came across a small clump of trees growing tightly next to each other. As I stood there wondering how they had come to grow that way, I noticed something on the ground just beyond one of the trees that looked like a stick, but it was white in color which was intriguing. So I walked closer to it, and when I got close enough to pick it up, this creature that I can only describe as a monster appeared from behind the tree right next to me. It was tall, at least eight feet, had gray skin, black eyes and no nose, nothing that you could call a normal mouth, just an opening where its face met its neck. It also had long fingers with sharp claws instead of hands. Shockingly, the creature was so startled by me that it let out a screeching sound and ran away. I was too shocked to move for about 20 seconds, but when I snapped out of it, I booked it back to my campsite. The old couple from before were just returning from their hike as I arrived back at camp. They asked me if everything was all right because they said I looked like I had seen a ghost. I blurted out all about what happened and the couple seemed genuinely concerned for me. I'm not sure if they were concerned at that point because they believed me or because they thought I was having some sort of an episode. The husband offered to sit with me the rest of the night if I wanted him to, but after a while I felt much better and we all relaxed and continued about our respective business just sitting and relaxing at our sites. And then, at around 9.30 in the evening, we both heard the loud noise of something slamming into one of the trees behind us. It made a noise that even shook the ground, which scared the crap out of everyone there. The one dog belonging to the couple started barking in the direction of the noise and wouldn't stop. So, the husband got up to see what was going on, and there, behind the trees, was the same thing I had seen earlier. And it started throwing rocks at him and his dog. We could even hear them hitting from where we were. He ran back to his campsite and I watched as this thing chased him back, but it continued running towards the trail that we had all been on earlier. I then watched it follow the trail until it reached a bend where it disappeared into the forest. We never saw or heard from it again after that. The husband and wife packed up their things instantly though, said goodbye and drove off in their car. I stayed the rest of the night by myself and didn't sleep a wink. I still don't know why or how I even did that. The next morning I packed up my stuff and left as quickly as possible. Needless to say, I haven't been back to Yosemite since then because it completely ruined the experience for me. And no, this thing wasn't a Sasquatch or Bigfoot. It was something else entirely that looked like an alien with gray skin and black eyes. Whatever this thing was, it wasn't normal at all. 
I've been camping and hiking all over the country and have never experienced anything like this. Whatever it was, it wanted us out of that campground and did everything in its power to scare us away. About five years ago, I was a single parent living just outside of Asheville, North Carolina. Anyone familiar with that area probably knows about the Great Smoky Mountains nearby, as well as several additional national forests. I had moved down to Asheville from Pennsylvania with my ex to follow his job, but it ended up not working out. Unfortunately, that wasn't surprising, but I was then stuck in the area for a while until I could save enough money to afford to move back north. I had enough money to stay in Asheville for a few weeks while the legal stuff got sorted out, so that was good. I was spending my free time taking care of my toddler and applying to jobs back up north whenever I could. One reason I was so intent on getting out of North Carolina quickly was that I wasn't used to this kind of rural setting. I thought I'd grown up in a country area with a few dairy farms around, but I was definitely wrong. My ex was a land developer and we had moved down here as their company was snapping up land and turning it into subdivisions. This was great for them, not so much for me. We moved into a little house in a more remote area, and our nearest neighbor was actually a logging company, so I didn't have anyone to talk to regularly. Sometimes I would call my sister back home to chat. She was married with a few kids of her own, or I'd spend a while talking to the male person, usually an older woman named Jen, who would come down our long driveway to deliver the mail. I'd told Jen about the divorce. She was sympathetic, and I think felt bad for me. After that, she hung around more often to chat. She was great with my daughter, and I was happy for some human interaction. With a little less than two weeks to go until I could move back home, winter started creeping up. And I wasn't thrilled with being way out in the woods in case a freak storm came through. But either way, it was nice to pack up at my own pace. So one evening I was packing up the majority of the kitchen, except for necessities. The house was surrounded by pine trees, so we were covered in shade relatively early in the evening, and it also got dark faster in our area. As I said, I wasn't comfortable in this kind of rural setting, so I always kept the garage light on so that I could always see the top of the driveway where I parked my car. I had just started putting away a set of fancy dinnerware that we'd been given as a wedding gift when I heard what sounded like a rock hitting a window. I stopped to listen but I found it hard to concentrate as my daughter started making noise in her high chair. I walked over to quiet her down and heard the sound again, a little pinging sound like a rock hitting glass and bouncing off. It was coming from the direction of the living room. Immediately, I stiffened up. After all, I was alone in this house with a toddler in an area I didn't really like. The nearest person would hopefully respond if I needed... The lights were off in the living room, so I just stuck my head into the room and looked at the windows quickly. As I glanced around, a rock bounced off the far window and I jerked back into the kitchen. Probably just a kid playing around, I tried to convince myself, but knew there weren't any kids in the area. Kylie, my daughter, didn't seem bothered by what was happening and I went back to her, shushing her as if she was the one who needed comforting. For a few minutes it was quiet and I was just starting to catch my breath when I heard the garage door rattle. It was one of those big metal doors that you have to pull down over the carport. I ran to the kitchen window and looked out into the driveway, where the light clearly outlined something walking around. At first, I thought I was looking at someone in a Halloween costume. It looked like a werewolf getup, but I realized quickly that it was too realistic, not loose like I would expect a costume to be. What I was looking at was a large, dog-like creature standing on its hind legs. I could only watch as it moved around the side of the garage and made another banging sound. It must have been hitting the side of the garage for some reason. As soon as I couldn't see it anymore, I went and grabbed Kylie and headed upstairs, where I could look down on the front yard out of the bedroom window. We stayed up there for maybe ten minutes before I heard a vehicle come down the driveway. It was the mail truck with headlights on, and I held Kylie tightly as I ran back downstairs to meet Jen. I didn't open the screen door right away, and she looked confused, waiting on the porch. Hey! 
I said to her breathlessly, and then explained what had happened. She listened without interrupting, only turning once to look at the garage door, which was closed. When I finished, she stepped off the porch and went to the garage. I warned her to be careful. She took her phone out, took a few photos, and came back to the house to show me through the screen door. The photos were of footprints which I can only describe them as really big hind paws. If I spread my hand out, they were larger than that, and five-toed. Jen could tell how freaked out I was and started to explain to me about the supposed dogmen in the area. I hadn't heard of them before. This wasn't any kind of legend I'd heard back home. She told me that there were a few reports every year and they were really similar to mine. Dogmen coming to remote houses and messing with things. Never hurting anyone, but always doing something to scare people. The banging on the garage and throwing rocks was pretty standard. She told me that if I hadn't gone upstairs, I probably would have seen it looking through the first floor windows at me. All I can say is, I'm happy I didn't. I probably would have had a heart attack. A few weeks later, as planned, I moved back north to a much more populated area about 10 minutes away from my sister. Kylie is seven now, and every now and then I wonder if I should tell her this story when she's older. But I think she's like me, and it would probably mess with her more than help. Anyway, there is no reason for her to really know about it. My ex is still in North Carolina and will probably stay there. I often wonder if he's encountered anything. Doesn't really matter, though, because there is no way I'd be willing to go back down there. This encounter isn't something I'd want to experience again. I was born and raised in the small town of Greenbrier County, West Virginia. It's a beautiful place nestled in the Appalachian Mountains. My family has lived in this area for generations, and I'm proud to have my roots from here. I grew up exploring all the forests and streams and hunting and fishing with my dad. It's a simple life, but it's one that I cherish. Unfortunately, though, I've been offered a job transfer to another state. And even though I'm reluctant to leave, I know it's a good opportunity. So, I'm heading to Roanoke, Virginia, just a few hours drive south. But since I have such deep roots and great memories here, one thing I wanted to do before leaving was go hiking one last time at Beartown State Park to soak up the beauty of the local wilderness. Beartown is known for its unusual rocky formations, massive boulders, overhanging cliffs and deep crevices. Basically, it looks like a surreal landscape and you can really get lost in the massive rock formations. So that's why I found myself on a Saturday morning in early April, setting out to walk the Beartown Trail. The day was chilly, but sunny, and I had packed a lunch to eat at the top of one of the rocks. I figured it would spend the whole day there walking around and reflecting on the area. But about an hour into the hike, things started to feel off. I began to feel like I was being watched, and not by the usual suspects like deer or squirrels, but by something else. I had been here so many times I couldn't count them, but something about this feeling was different. I tried to shake it off, but it persisted. I started to wonder if I was really more nervous about moving than I had thought. But as I was pondering that, I heard something following behind me. It sounded like heavy footsteps crunching leaves with each step. But every time I turned around, there was nothing there. I began to walk faster, but the footsteps kept pace with me. And then I heard something else. A deep, guttural, growling sound. It was definitely coming from behind me, from whatever was following me. I turned around again, but still saw nothing. And then, out of the corner of my eye, I saw something move something big and furry. It was dodging in and out of the trees and rocks, staying just out of sight. I started to run, but it was no use. Whatever was following me was faster. And then before I knew it, I could feel it closing in on me, which is not a feeling I can describe adequately enough to get you to know how I felt. This time, when I turned around, I could see it. It was a large, furry creature with yellow eyes. It looked like a cross between a bear and a dog and it was walking on two legs. I was paralyzed with fear. I had never seen anything like this before. And then in my head, I heard it. I swear I heard the words, leave. It growled in a deep, guttural voice. 
Leave now. And it was definitely coming after me. I turned and ran as fast as I could, but it was right behind me. I could feel its hot breath on the back of my neck. And then, just as it was about to catch up to me, I swung around with my backpack out in my outstretched arms. I was swinging it like I was holding a baseball bat. I don't know how I had the courage to do it, but I managed to connect with its head, which stopped it for a second. I'm sure I just surprised it, but at least it gave me a few seconds of time. I turned and ran the other way as fast as I could. But this time, I literally didn't look back until I was out of the woods and back to my car. I had been hoping to see other people when I got to the parking lot, but it was empty when I got there. I paused and looked back at the woods, but there was no sign of the creature. Nothing at all. Not even moving in the trees. I climbed into my car and drove away, trying to make sense of what had just happened. I'm still not sure what that creature was. But ever since then I've been convinced that there are things in this world that we don't know about. Things that we can't explain. And also whatever that thing was, it definitely wasn't friendly. As if you couldn't have figured that out already. I've thought about it a lot, but I still don't know what that creature was. I can only think that it was some kind of Sasquatch or Yeti type creature. Maybe even a werewolf. But whatever it was, I'm just glad I made it out alive. It's honestly all I care about at this point. And it was January, the start of the spring semester, and some friends of mine were throwing this huge party to welcome everyone back. I was having a great time, honestly, for the majority of the night. Something that I noticed early on, when I had first arrived, was that there was garbage scattered all across the front yard. All the trash bags and cans have been toppled over and torn into. Obviously, I assumed this was because of some animal, but it was actually insane how much trash was scattered about. I mention this because not only was the yard of the frat house trashed, but so were the yards of nearly every other adjacent house on the block. It seemed like whatever was messing with the garbage was big and hungry. Coming from a rural area myself, we had a lot of times where we had an unwelcome stay from a family of raccoons, or even the occasional bear. But it was never as bad as the way that block looked, so much so that everyone I was with that day commented on it too. And then, that was the last I thought of it. Until later. A few hours later, around midnight, I went out on the back porch for a smoke with my friends. That's when I noticed that the porch reeked like urine, and something else I couldn't put my finger on. I assumed someone partied too hard and peed on the porch as a joke or something. I don't know, I couldn't think of any reason other than that. We're out there for a little while when all of the sudden we hear a yell coming from the opposite side of the yard, from the front of the house. It takes me a second to register what the hell is going on, but my friends run back inside to try and see what the fuss is about. So there I am, alone on the porch, with no idea about the impending weird stuff I'm about to witness. I hear a distant conversation yelling, but I'm not paying too much attention to it. I'm just sort of looking out into the yard. Then I see it run by. Coming from the front of the house is a creature that is big, massive even, and sprinting fast as hell. In fact, it was so quick that at first I didn't have a slight idea what it even looked like, only that it was speeding right through the yard, and it was big. Then it stops. It stops right near the edge of the yard, where the forest starts. It sits there for a moment, and even though it's dark, I managed to finally get a decent look at it. It was some kind of wolf, dog, man combination. Just the grossest thing you could imagine, sitting there on all fours and frothing at the mouth, I choked. It scared the crap out of me, and I just choked on my cigarette with the loudest, most obnoxious cough you've ever heard. This was, of course, a huge mistake. The wolf creature snaps its head towards me, and now we're making eye contact. I thought I was going to die, honestly. My nerves were shot. I just kept hoping that maybe someone would come back outside to check on me or something. I wanted to yell. But I knew that if I did, it would probably set this thing off somehow, so I kept quiet. As I'm looking at it, the freakiest thing happens. This wolf, it gets up and it stands on its hind legs, still staring. 
Now I really think I'm losing my mind because as big as I thought it was before, now the thing is standing at least seven feet in the air. Taller than me, taller than any person I've ever been next to. It was so confusing to look at, really. But I wasn't so messed up that I didn't know what I was seeing. I could tell this wasn't normal. It had these crazy eyes, like glowing human eyes on a dog-like head. I told you already about how tall the thing was, but it wasn't just tall, it was also jacked. It's odd. Human torso was insanely muscular, which explains how it moved around so quickly, I suppose. I just didn't fully comprehend its anatomy. Even the human parts had fur, and even the animal parts looked vaguely human-shaped. We just sat there for a moment, looking at each other. I stood as still as I possibly could, and as boring as that might sound, it worked. Eventually I won the staring match, and the monster thing just sort of became bored, I think. Lost interest in me. It turned around and ran straight into the woods without so much as a second glance. I will never forget that thing, its eyes, the novelty of it all. My sister and I spent our childhood summers at our mom's cousin's ranch in Montana. We and our cousins would ride horses through the woods for hours at a time. We would all head out, doubled up on horseback, and ride on siding roads along pastures and hay fields and into national forest following old logging roads. There were usually four of us, sometimes up to six, and we often had our cousin's dogs along too. I was pretty young the first time I remember seeing what we all referred to as the Phantom of the Fork in the Road. I was probably around three or four years old, which lets you know how significant these experiences were, as that is awfully young to remember stuff. I remember coming out of our family's timbered property into a clearing that had two other dirty pathways kind of spoking out of a gated fence. You could go straight ahead on the same small dirt road we were on, veer to the left or veer right and have to climb down from your horse and open a barbed wire and log gate to continue into the national forest land. Our route took us right. When riding up to the clearing, you had a good view of the entire scene from a ways back. The fork was entirely empty of people and animals. We were all riding and chatting and then one by one we all got quiet as our minds adjusted to what we were seeing. It was like blinking a blurry image into focus. Where we had all been looking as we emerged from the timberline, there had been nothing. Then a man began to take shape right at the fork. He was just standing there in a plaid flannel, work pants, and boots. The thing that spooked me as a tiny kid was that he carried a rifle in his hand. We slowed the horses but continued toward the clearing as we wanted to open the gated road into the forest service land. My sister, several years older than me, asked our cousin, Do you know who that is? She replied, no, but he never bothers us. I remember thinking that it was all right considering our cousins had run into him before. I don't recall if the dogs were with us this time, but the horses did not respond strangely. We passed within 12 or 15 feet of him as we rode up to the gate. He appeared very solid. He was very real looking. You could make out the seams and buttons on his clothing and the tooling of his rifle sling. My oldest cousin dismounted and opened the gate, and we all rode through, leading her horse. We turned to watch her close the gate, and the man was still standing back where we had first seen him watching us watching him. My cousin got back on her horse, and we took a final glance up to the man, but he was not there. It couldn't have been more than eight to ten seconds from the last time we saw him. There was nowhere he could have moved that quickly and quietly. We would have seen or heard him run off. I was so young I didn't think much of it, I was more excited to keep riding, but I remember the older kids, the oldest was 16 years old, being pretty weirded out by it. One of my cousins said, yep, that's what he does. This was not a one-time event, it happened at least four more times over about six summers, always the same man, same place, same clothing, same gun, the same image coming into focus as we rode by, and then looking back at nothing. The last time I saw the Phantom, I was 11 years old, and my 14-year-old cousin and I were riding alone. The exact same thing happened as had unfolded all those times before. 
He never spoke to us. We never spoke to him. The dogs never seemed to even notice him, and the horses didn't react. I went back in my twenties to see if maybe I could conjure him up, but never saw him. I just wanted to see, with the advantage of adulthood, what those experiences had been and either try to come up with a rational explanation or be convinced that he really was a paranormal being. This story took place in Hardyville, South Carolina, around 2009, at a house my mom and stepfather built. My stepfather, we will call him Roy, had gotten a call that his cousin had passed away suddenly due to a gruesome car accident. He made plans to take the day off for the funeral coming up. The day of the funeral, my mom and Roy let me stay home since I was still kind of young and didn't really know the guy. So I stayed home and finished painting the hallway walls and the trim for my mom and listened to the radio as I worked. I was probably 15 at the time. Nothing new with staying home alone. I was an only child and matured quickly, so I was pretty responsible. A few hours went by and they arrived back home. I just want to mention, even though I was painting, I didn't have any windows open. We had central air with good circulation, and it was pretty cold outside, so I kept them closed. We also had no pets at the time. As they walked in the door, I was finishing up at the kitchen sink, washing out the paintbrush. I asked them how the funeral went and how everyone was. With my parents behind me talking, a door from the other side of the house slammed out of nowhere. Now I've heard doors slam. This was no measly slam. Whichever door slammed, it shut so hard you would have thought that the frame cracked. It hurt my ears from the other side of the house. Right after that happened, we all looked at each other with a bewildered and scared look on our faces. My stepfather is a straightforward guy doesn't really believe in anything supernatural. My mom and I, however, grew up seeing and hearing spirits, so we were certainly believers. So the next step was for someone to go back to the other end of the house to see which door it was and the cause. Roy's face was a little ashen, and he didn't volunteer. I made a cross on my heart right after and started praying that whatever did that would get the hell out of there. I certainly wasn't brave enough to volunteer. So, my brave mother volunteered herself as a tribute. She walked down the hallway and made her way through all of the rooms, closets, and bathrooms by herself to check things out. A few minutes later, I hear her coming back down the hall. When she makes it back to the kitchen where Roy and I haven't heard budged from, I see her face looks kind of unsettled. I asked her whose door was shut, mentally hoping it was not mine. She said, They're all open. Nothing else happened that day, but we were all kind of on edge for a while. Maybe it was Roy's cousin saying goodbye in an odd way. Maybe it was the house itself. A lot of weird things happened there. Even though it was a new build, I think it was the land, or Roy, causing it. Roy wasn't a good guy, so I'm thinking something manifested from his darkness or the land had some history. Here's a story from back when I lived in Washington, D.C. We lived in a small burb which is split between Maryland and D.C. known as Tacoma Park. TKPK as they call it, and it is known as a very progressive kind of hippie village inside the Beltway of D.C. Some call it the Berkeley of the East. We bought our first home there as it was a relatively inexpensive place to buy a home at the time inside the Beltway. This house was pretty old and sat atop a slight hill, providing you a bit of an overlook towards downtown D.C. You couldn't see much, but an interesting view nonetheless. The property had a long staircase that was very steep leading to the front porch of the home. One night, I was having a cigarette on the front porch around 1 a.m. At that time, the neighbors would have been in bed so as to not see me smoking. I've had my periods of being off and on but for the most part, don't smoke. As I was smoking, I began hearing this loud thumping sound, yet it was more of a clap than thump. It sounded like someone was running with sneakers on, but there was something very unordinary about it. I look around trying to identify the sound when I peer down from the perch I had from our porch. To my surprise, there is a creature standing less than a foot running at an incredibly fast speed right down the middle of our avenue. 
I could clearly see it had a small head and body like a human. Honestly, it happened so fast I can't really pinpoint a description. That area does have wildlife. It was common to have deer, squirrels, and foxes in our yard at times. Thought never had I seen anything like that, especially darting down the middle of the road. To this day, I still haven't a clue as to what I saw. I had a strange series of events a few weeks ago. I'm a bit of night owl and don't sleep till 5 or 6 in the morning. One night I had gone to sleep earlier, but as I was just lying there, I heard a strange noise outside my window. I heard a strange chirping-like noise at 4 in the morning. There's no owls near my house. Cats occasionally wander my neighborhood, but not near my house. I call it chirping, but it wasn't like how a bird chirps. Even more, it was like two different sets of chirping. It sounded like two creatures talking. I used the term creatures because the next day I asked a family member to check the area as I had to work. I have a photo of a footprint I can't identify. No one in my house would be awake at that time, nor does it look like a shoe. I saw the area after I had gotten out of work. It was still there and looked humanoid. I haven't heard anything like it since, but it's had me an alert. My second strange event happened in 2016 and near my house. I'd gone for a walk in the summer and lost track of time. It was near 9 in the evening, and I was walking towards my neighborhood as I saw a strange being. It looked like it was in some sort of camouflage like the Predator, but shaped like a person. It kind of took the shape of myself. It was about my height 5'7 and kind of skinny. I could vaguely see through it. It was about 10 feet away from me. I was hesitant to move closer to it. I took a few steps to move closer. It started to disappear after moving closer to it. I finally walked home in a hurry and tried to put it out of my mind. Back in the mid-1970s, I was given temporary duty orders to a school at the Naval Air Station in Pensacola. This was a four-month school at the Navy Hospital there, so I was able to take my wife and our one-year-old daughter along with me. We were lucky enough to find an available one-bedroom apartment immediately off the causeway to the main gate of the base. This was an older apartment complex, probably about 30 years old or so. With our move and disruption to our lives, this gave our daughter some challenges, and it was very hard for her to fall asleep in our bedroom with us. For several weeks, she would often cry for hours and hours before she went to sleep. So one night, we decided to let her stay in the room and cry until she would finally fall asleep. My wife and I stayed in the living room watching the television with all of the lights off, except for the bathroom light. After a while, we heard a rattling noise from the front door. Thinking it was our neighbors coming home, we turned toward the door and noticed something very strange. Soon thereafter, our daughter stopped crying. After a few minutes, my wife turned to me and asked me if I saw something. I told her that I had. I saw an older woman in a nightgown float through the wall from the hallway and through the door to our bedroom. She was luminous and was indeed floating and not walking. My wife responded that this is exactly what she witnessed as well. It was immediately after that that our daughter stopped crying. From then on, she didn't have a problem falling asleep at night. Needless to say, my wife and I slept in the living room during the rest of our stay there in Florida. Once you witness something like that, there is no one that could ever convince either of us that ghosts don't exist. This is something I don't talk about with many people. In fact, it's only one other person, and that's on occasion. I am comfortable talking to this friend about it because he experienced the same thing on the same night as my former brother-in-law and I did. The only thing was we had to be an easy 10 to 20 miles apart, if not more. This happened years and years ago when I was 16 or 17. I'm 33 now. My ex-brother-in-law and myself decided we wanted to go fishing on a small pond on the side of Sadler Road in Bristol, Michigan. To give context, Bristol is a small town in mid-northern Michigan. It consists of a party store, gas station, and a town hall straight out of a Clint Eastwood movie. Most land out there is state land or national forest. In other words, 
lots of critters and wildlife. It's not uncommon to see, smell, or hear black bear. White-tailed deer are everywhere. We even have the occasional bobcat, lynx, and mountain lion. I have spent more than my fair share of time in the woods there. Countless nights on the Muskegon River, salmon fishing till 3 or 4 in the morning, sometimes until sunrise. Sitting in the deer blind, hours before sunlight. So, I have heard just about everything you can hear in the northern lower peninsula of Michigan. But this night we heard something that scared the three of us to the core. My ex-brother-in-law and I decided to go do some fishing around sunset. As I said, we decided on a small pond off a dirt road in the middle of the wood. By the time we got there, the sun was still up, but getting ready to set. The pond butted up right against the shoulder of the road, maybe two or three feet off the road. This pond can't be more than two acres. One side is marshy and hard to get to the water. The rest is surrounded by this woodland. I went to the right side of the pond after fishing from the road for a bit. By the time I worked my way through the trees, my ex-brother-in-law had worked his way to the left. He made it through the marshy land to the water. I was catching little blue gill and other pan fish on my side. He wasn't catching anything where he was. So he decided to move over by me. Doing so may have saved his life. I feel it did anyways. When he got to my side, the sun had finally set, and with that it was starting to get difficult to see. At this point, we heard nothing out of the ordinary and were not concerned about anything. When out of nowhere, from the opposite side of the pond, we heard the most bone-chilling sound I've ever heard, including to this day. Keep in mind this is only maybe two to five minutes after my ex-brother-in-law left that exact area. We didn't see anything, or at least I didn't, he never said if he did. But this creature, whatever it was, did not want us there and it was made very clear. It was so loud and ear-piercing that it literally made your heart skip. Like I said, I've heard a lot of the critters out there. This was not a natural sound. It was a high-pitched scream blended with a low demonic growl. Neither of us are small guys, nor scare very easily. This creature was either there when we got there and was watching us for over an hour, or it somehow it moved through the thick overgrowth and we never heard it. From the sound, this wasn't anything small, it had to be incredibly large. Either way, just the sound it made caused two decent-sized backwoods guys to sprint out of the woods and throw our fishing gear into the car, and we raced away. The only thing that was said on the ride home was, that better have been someone screwing with us. It wasn't until a few days later a friend that is more of a woodsy person than myself. In fact, he is former military. Anyway, he told my ex-brother-in-law that almost 10 plus miles away at another body of water known as Wide Waters, on the same night around the same time he heard the exact same sound. He said it was so evil that even he packed up and went home. Everyone has their Sasquatch Bigfoot encounter or stories. This, whatever it was, was no Bigfoot. It was pure evil, and it was clear if we didn't leave when we did, we may have not left those woods at all. What I do think it was is something some say is a legend and is not real, but I know for sure it was Dogman. To this day, when I'm camping or fishing, I'm always on alert, especially at or near nighttime. Even here in Iowa, where I live now, it gave me a whole new respect for the woods. You're probably doing better than I am. I was just fired from my job because of something I saw. For several years, I've been working for this company that creates VR and 3D interactive photos for the purposes of construction, selling real estate, logistics, creating virtual tours for companies. My latest assignment was to do a 3D scan of one floor of an old office building the client was trying to rent out. I have to say, right off the bat, this place gave me the creeps. I was ready to take the photos and 3D scans of this place and get out of there as quickly as possible. When I took the first scan, I couldn't capture anything in the room because of what appeared like a thick white fog that covered the entire room. I didn't see any fog in there with my eyes, so I figured it had to be smudges on the lenses of the 3D camera. I cleaned the lenses and I tried to capture the room again. 
When I looked at the footage of the scan, all that showed up was what looked like a dense fog that filled the room again. I was pretty frustrated and I believed it was a technical malfunction of either the camera or our software that was causing me to waste my time in this run-down, creepy building. I moved on to a room on the other side of the building, thinking maybe it was some sort of electromagnetic interference. After doing another scan, I got the same result and figured I would try again later with different equipment. I took the 3D camera and my computer back to my work and had this guy Eric from the IT department look at the files of the scans. He told me that he'd never seen this happen before and that it must be a glitch with the software on my computer. He gave me another camera and computer and I headed back to the old building. As soon as I got back in there, I felt uneasy. But I was just ready to complete the job and never come back to that place again. I set up my equipment and took a scan of the main room. When I looked at the footage, it had successfully scanned the whole room, but it looked like there was a red filter on all the footage. It reminded me of those old 007 movies where James Bond shoots the screen and the blood drips down over the camera lens. I tried it several more times and all the footage was still red. I called my boss and explained all the technical malfunctions I was having. He told me to take the equipment to IT and try again tomorrow. The next day, I went up to IT, and Eric told me that all the equipment was working perfectly now. Relieved, I made my way back to the building and was ready to get this job behind me. I set everything up and began the scan. I left the room so I wouldn't be in the footage, and after a few moments, I went back in. I checked the footage, and this time on the computer screen, it said there was an error capturing the scan. I tried again, and when I came back in, my computer said the same thing. I called it and they told me to restart the computer, unplug the camera, and plug it back in. I did as they instructed and then I couldn't get my computer to register the camera as being plugged in. It told me to bring the equipment to them and they would give me new equipment that they were sure worked perfectly. This was getting old and I was really frustrated but I headed back to work. I went to IT, gave the old equipment to Eric, picked up the supposed working equipment, and went back to the building. I did another scan, prayed it would work, and went to check on the footage. This time, I had captured the room perfectly, except there was a dark figure of what looked like a man's shadow in the corner of the room. Assuming that this was somehow my own shadow, I set the equipment up to do another scan, ran out of the room and made sure I left plenty of time for the camera to scan the whole room. Keep in mind, I'd been doing this for years and had never had any problems before. When I got back into the room, the camera was smashed on the ground, and the computer said that the scan was incomplete. This camera had a round stand on the bottom, so it was pretty much impossible for it to tip over. Something must have picked it up and hurled it onto the ground. It was also an expensive camera made of sturdy metal. It wasn't the type of thing to break easily. I freaked out, grabbed everything, and ran out of there. I took it to it and explained what happened. He looked at me like I was crazy, so I begged him to look at my past captures, the fog, the redness, the dark figure, and my last attempt for anything out of the ordinary. The computer read that the scan was incomplete, but Eric was able to extract what the camera had captured before it was smashed. There was a gray hand reaching toward the camera. We both froze and stared at it. I was terrified and asked him to send me the files. I ran to my boss's office and explained to him what had happened. He accused me of lying and fired me on the spot for destroying company property and for time theft. I begged him to look at the footage and told him I wasn't lying, but he had security escort me out of the building with all my stuff. Later I called Eric to send me the files, and he told me to meet him for coffee. At the coffee shop, Eric told me that our boss had all the files erased and the computer that I captured it on destroyed. I still can't believe this happened to me. Why were the spirits in the building so hostile to me? I don't understand why my boss acted the way he did towards me. Why would he want the evidence destroyed? Why did he want me fired so quickly? So many unanswered questions, and I'm forced to just move on and get another job. I'm still in shock over everything that happened. I live in a suburb of Los Angeles, right by a recognizable body of water, and I'll leave it at that.
The lake was a nice place to swim and was a nice alternative to the salty ocean water and noisy beaches. I was a swimmer in high school and college before I joined the adult world and became a working stiff. It was a nice way to relax after a difficult day at the office. My town has a local legend. It was always a silly joke that no one took seriously. Since I was a kid, I was told by teachers and adults that the lake was home to a terrifying sea serpent. It used to terrify us as kids, but it became a draw to the lake. Tourists flocked to our small town, and it became an expensive resort town, hoping to see the serpent. The locals seemed to adopt this legend as enthusiastically as the tourists. My swim team cover layers had the same sea serpent decal as the touristy t-shirts. It was a point of pride for us, we're the sea monsters. We're ferocious and we swim faster than you. That is always what it was to me. A silly story and a campy mascot. Any actual query into the existence of this creature was always seen as kind of dumb. It was like a conspiracy theory, fun to talk about, but not that deep. Anyone who read that deep into this type of story was seen as a troll or making fun. Nothing too serious about it. The day of the incident was the hottest day on record. It was peak summer, and the humidity coming off the lake made it very uncomfortable to walk around. When I arrived at work, the unthinkable happened. The air conditioner was broken. It had to be 95 degrees at my desk. So a few co-workers and I found our way to our favorite nearby coffee shop and rubbed elbows around a tiny table. Wi-Fi cost money, so we all switched off paying for an hour. It was the best we could manage out of a miserable day. After what felt like an eternity, we made it to five in the evening. My co-workers wanted to get drinks, but I decided to head home. I had enough of being in such proximity to all of them, I really wanted some space. I was also dying for a swim. I said goodbye and went home. I changed into my bathing suit and got my bike out of the basement. I set out around the lake and made pretty good time. Slowly the suburban sidewalks turned into a dirt path until I got to my usual swimming spot. It took some bushwhacking off the road but the view of the city was beautiful and it was a spot that was entirely unknown. I took my shirt off and left it by my bike and prepared for the swim. The water felt amazing on my legs, and I found myself immediately diving straight into the cool water. Relief flooded through me instantly. That thing I was craving all day felt so good. I finally cleared my head and started to relax. I bobbed up and down a bit in the water at first and then treaded water. I should have known something was off when I heard the frogs. Usually this was a quiet spot, but this evening it was like a symphony. It unnerved me slightly that they were so loud. It made something feel different about today. I don't know why, but the lake felt impossibly large, and I had never been smaller. Still, the water felt nice, and I was dying to get my blood flowing. I started to work on my crawl stroke until I was almost at the center of the lake. I treaded water and began to float on my back while I looked up at the stars. I closed my eyes for what must have been a second. I swear on my life something swam past me. I know well the sensation of a swimmer going past you and this felt the same. But it was fast. And big. I righted myself in the water and looked around. Nothing. All was quiet. I took this as my sign to head back to shore, so I began swimming again. While crawling, I took breaths under my right arm, just as I was taught. As I neared the shore, I saw something. It looked like a huge eye. The eye of a fish. In my panic, I flipped around and righted myself once again. Nothing on the surface. I looked down. Something gigantic, much larger than me, swam twenty feet under my legs. I looked hard in the water, trying to make out its features. Whatever it was, it stopped some distance away from me. It had a long body like a snake, and the head of a dragon I had seen on a television show. The water around me was still warm from how fast it passed me. Then in a moment it dipped down into the darkness of the lake. A few days have passed since then. I don't remember getting home, but I must have gone fast. I've been going about my days like normal, but no swimming. 
I began to do some reading to see if anyone had experienced what I had seen or anything like that. I grew up in a small town in Vermont. Actually, small town doesn't even begin to describe the desolation of the place. We had just under 600 people living there. It was so small that all the kids went to a consolidated high school half an hour north of our town. We shared the school with two other districts, ours being the smallest of the bunch. My crush wasn't from my town. She didn't even know my name. The classic unreachable type. On the honor roll and a place in student council, always smiling and surrounded by new friends. One day at lunch when I was a junior, one of my friends dared me to go over and ask her out. I wasn't going to at first, but then I realized that it didn't really matter if it went badly. They would probably forget I existed by the end of the day. And besides, it seemed exactly like the type of thing she would do if she was in my position. I started walking toward her lunch table, mentally cursing the friend who'd put me up to this, and I instantly started getting looks from the other people at his table. When I finally got to the table, she looked up at me and her smile eased my nerves a little. I introduced myself and asked her out in one gesture. I was awkward as hell, but trying to play it cool. There was a party that night, she said, and she said she would love it if I stopped by. I couldn't believe it and was beaming inside. My friends couldn't believe it either, but like they really didn't believe me. They started getting all in my head, telling me that it was a prank or something, like there was no way someone like her would want anything to do with me. I was pretty upset for the rest of the day about hearing that. My friends were such jerks. There was no way I wanted them killing my buzz that night. So I ducked out of school as soon as I heard the final bell. When I got home, the phone rang a few times, but I let all the calls go to the machine. I was sure it was just my lame friends trying to get a last-minute invite to the coolest party of the year. No chance. I hopped in my car around 7.45. The party started at 8, she said, and it was way over in the deepest part of their town. It was going to take at least 45 minutes to get there, so I figured I'd be fashionably late. My town was especially quiet that night. Some of the lights were on inside the pharmacy and the police station, but I didn't see any pedestrians on my way out. I don't think I even passed a car. Sure, it was a small town, but something was off. I saw that my gas was running low, so I pulled into the gas station before I left the town limits. I couldn't see anyone working in the store. The attendant was nowhere to be found so I filled my tank myself and headed out. The back roads of this particular part of Vermont are eerie. Always have been. Driving them alone at night is its own sort of isolation. That night the town was empty and I was literally the only one on the road, but I just knew I wasn't alone. I randomly got goosebumps all over my body like someone had dropped an ice cube down the back of my shirt. Fear rushed over me for a second before I came to... It was dark as hell out there, and I wasn't sure whether or not I was going to pass out. If I had gotten into an accident, who knows when someone would find me. I pulled off the road, into a small dirt clearing on the outskirts of the woods. I put the car in park and kept the engine on, gripping the wheel tightly, trying to slow my heart rate. I needed some air. I got out of the car and put my hands on my knees. I was starting to feel normal. But then I stood up and arched my back in a stretch, and when I looked up at the sky I gasped. I saw a dark mass above me, like directly above me, floating about twenty feet in the air. The night was incredibly dark, and the object blended almost seamlessly into the sky. The headlights of my car were just barely reflecting some of their glow onto the shiny black thing. My mouth went dry, and I stood there for a few moments as if I was made of stone. I was in shock. This thing was floating in mid-air. Something whirred from the flying thing. Something mechanical. This was enough to wake me up, and I literally jumped back into my car. I poked my head out the window and looked up at the sky. The thing had now repositioned itself ever so slightly so that it hovered directly above my car. I stared at it for a long time, like I was in a trance. 
Then that cold ice cube feeling came back, but this time, I knew I needed to get the hell out of there. I put the car in reverse and kicked up dust as I sped away. I didn't know what I was running from. If my thoughts were correct, the thing would be flying over me. Following my every move, I forgot about my crush. I started speeding back to town. And I was speeding. I was only 15 minutes out from the edge of town when I checked my tank. It was nearly empty. Before I could make excuses, I knew that the floating thing above me was responsible. It wanted me uncovered and defenseless out there in the pitch black. The ice cube feeling again. I felt my car start to rattle as I crossed the town line. But at least now there were street lights. Amazingly, I made it back to the gas station, but my car stopped. I had been cursing and sweating for the past 20 minutes. I wasn't going to get out of my car. No way. I woke up the next morning to the attendant tapping my windshield with a genuinely confused expression. I hesitantly stepped out of the car and looked up. Just a blue sky, nothing more. No floating object. I had the attendant fill my tank and headed home. Whatever had happened to me the night before was inexplicable, but I was just happy to be alive. Interestingly, I didn't feel like a loser anymore. Somehow, surviving that ordeal made me stand taller and feel more confident. Obviously, I never did make it to that party, but it never bothered me. I literally felt like a whole new person after that. I'm a police officer and sometimes we see some unbelievable things, mostly of the human variety, but I do have a story that I thought your listeners might appreciate. I've never experienced anything paranormal before, and I don't scare easily, but the story I'm about to tell you is the strangest, creepiest thing that's ever happened to me. One night, my partner and I were on a dinner break in downtown Los Angeles, eating street tacos in our car. As we finished eating, we got a call from dispatch about a 911 emergency not too far from us. It was a 245 assault with a deadly weapon. The dispatcher told us that a terrified young woman called and said two men were trying to kill her, so we put on the flashing red and blues, turned on the siren and rushed over to an industrial area. The neighborhood is a bit sketchy, made up of warehouses and buildings, some of which are abandoned. I admit it's a bit ominous at night and transients wander around, but they mostly keep to themselves. We arrived at an old four-story brick building that looked like it hadn't been occupied in years. No one was around, no cars parked, nothing. We pulled out our flashlights and checked the front entrance, but the door was locked. Then we did a quick scan around the perimeter of the building, and that's when I thought I heard something coming from inside, up on the fourth floor. I shined my light on one of the windows and I swear to God, I saw someone standing there. It looked like a woman, but it was hard to tell through the grimy glass. I called out to my partner, but when we looked back up, no one was there. Thinking this girl was in trouble and with no time to waste, we ran around to the front. This time we were surprised that we found it slightly ajar. We looked at each other confused because we were certain it was locked before. Not taking any chances, we drew our weapons and proceeded inside. The place was a mess, trash strewn everywhere, walls spray-painted with graffiti, stained mattresses and bedding, and the pungent smell of body odor, urine, and feces. Moments after we entered, we heard a blood-curdling scream coming from somewhere upstairs. We ran up to the second floor and we could hear faint whimpering sounds, but it was hard to tell exactly where they were coming from. My partner and I split up to check the various rooms, but we found nothing. We heard the unmistakable sound of a woman crying, this time coming from the third floor. We bolted up the stairs, calling out to anyone that needed help, but we got no response. There was just the sound of crying. The third floor was dark with no signs of anyone. Again, my partner and I split up to investigate. I swore I heard crying coming from one of the rooms, but when I checked, no one was there. Then I heard it coming from a room across the hall, but when I looked, it was empty as well. I was getting frustrated and wondered if someone was pranking us. That's when I saw the silhouette of someone at the end of the hall. I shined my light, but the figure disappeared around a corner. 
I chased after it, calling for my partner, but when I rounded the corner, it led to another empty room. My partner caught up with me, and I told him what I saw, and he confirmed that he was hearing and seeing things, too. A loud banging sound made me jump, followed by the sound of footsteps. It came from above us on the fourth floor. As we made our way cautiously to the stairwell, there was another scream, agonized like someone was being murdered. We sprinted up the stairs, weapons aimed, scanning the halls with our flashlights. We decided not to split up this time. We called out, but received no answer. We heard that scream again. There was just something about it that sent shivers up my spine. It was coming from a room down the hall. As we got closer, the screams became louder. It was a woman begging for her life. We burst into the room and the screaming abruptly stopped. It was empty. My partner and I looked at each other, confirming that it was this room we heard the sounds coming from. I walked to a dirty window and looked down below. This was the exact window where I thought I saw someone when I was outside. None of it made sense. We searched the room and it was clear no one had been here for quite some time. While other rooms had evidence of squatters, this one did not. As I stood there trying to wrap my head around the situation, we heard that horrifying, disembodied scream again. This time it was directly in my ear as if someone was right next to me. It scared me so bad I nearly jumped through the ceiling. I looked at my partner and we both hightailed it out of there. We collected ourselves outside, but we didn't say anything. We just didn't have the words. I stopped a transient pushing a cart and asked if he had seen or heard anything. He said everyone knows to stay away from that building because it's haunted. Apparently a girl was killed there many years ago. I didn't do a good job of hiding how shook I was and he noticed, laughing at me as he went on his way. My partner said not to tell anyone at the station and half-jokingly mentioned that we should take a break from your stories for a bit. I said better yet, now we have something to share. I always thought that Bigfoot lived in the Pacific Northwest. I had never heard of a Bigfoot spotting in North Carolina, nor did I particularly believe in Bigfoot until I spotted one myself. I was camping with friends in Chimney Rock State Park, and I had headed off on a short solo hike to find a waterfall that had been in one of my favorite movies. I came to the top of a steep incline and the waterfall was below me. It was a beautiful scene and I reached for my cell phone to take some pictures. But when I looked at the screen, there was something odd in the frame. I thought that I was looking at a bear, but something didn't seem quite right. I lowered my phone and looked back at the spot. There was a giant, hairy creature standing on two legs in the water below the falls. Its back was to me. It was stooped over, and when it stood up with a large fish in its hand. And that's when I realized what I was seeing. It was Bigfoot. There is no doubt in my mind, the creature was at least seven feet tall. Every bit of it that I could see was covered in thick, dark hair. I froze in place when it turned around. I'm not sure if he smelled me, but I definitely smelled him. I was hit with what can only be described as a stench that was a mix of barnyard and roadkill. My cell phone slipped out of my hand and made a lot of noise as it bounced down the trail behind me and his head jerked to the side toward me. I was wearing a bright yellow jacket, so I knew that it would see me, but I was rooted in place. We made eye contact for several seconds, and I knew that if I made a run for it, he would be on me in a flash. Suddenly, I heard some footsteps behind me. I whirled around, terrified that another Bigfoot was between me and escape. But to my surprise, I saw a forest ranger making his way toward me. He waved, called out a cheerful, good morning, but I was too scared to respond. I turned back to the water, but the creature was gone. The ranger looked concerned when he saw my expression. Are you okay? Are you lost? I tried to respond, but just stuttered big, big, big while gesturing vaguely toward the waterfall. Ah, he said, you spotted our friendly neighborhood bear. No, I didn't see a bear. I saw it was big. I waved my hands in the air to try and show him how tall the creature was. You definitely saw a bear, he said firmly. Sometimes they stand up on their hind legs and they can look like other things. We keep the bear a secret around here. 
We don't want anyone showing up to hassle the bear. Too many bear hunters in these woods would ruin our peace and quiet, and it definitely won't end well for that bear. Do you understand what I'm saying? I did. He knew what I saw. He wanted me to keep quiet about it. Do you understand? He asked again. I nodded. He nodded. Okay, he said. Enjoy the rest of your day. I headed back down the trail as quickly as I could, scooping up my cell phone on the way. The screen was cracked, but I didn't really care. It gave me an excuse that explained why I hadn't taken any photos at the waterfall. My friends bought the story of the bear hook, line, and sinker. People are scared of hitchhikers, but I'm telling you, there are worse things out there. I was just trying to get out of Harvey, North Dakota and move on south for the winter. I had been doing some farm work in North Dakota, but since it was late fall, most of that was ending for the year. I now had to get all the way to Florida for the citrus season, but I had more time than money, so I made me a sign that just said south and set myself up on State Highway 52. Interstates are better because you get truckers and sometimes they're bored enough to pick you up. Also, they're not usually as scared of strangers as your average Joe or Jane driving in their own vehicle. I knew I could be waiting there a while, so I just sat down and leaned back, propped the sign up against my feet. After a while, though, I smelled something awful wafting through the air around me. It would come and go, but when I could smell it, it was really strong. I looked around, but all I saw was the road, no roadkill, and a bunch of trees set back from the road a little way. I thought maybe it was my imagination. But then, I don't know if the wind shifted or what, because I smelled it again. Well, I've been hitching long enough to know when it's time to move on down the road, so I did. The trees continued along this part of the highway, but I didn't pay much attention to them. At least not yet, anyway. By now it was early afternoon. I'd started out at 11 a.m. When I left the motel where I was staying in Harvey. I didn't want to start out too early since I'd paid for the room, but also because the morning was cold. I lugged my pack and my sign down the road south for a while. I hadn't seen many cars pass by so far, and obviously none of them had stopped at this point. Finally I set the pack down again and sat back against it. I thought I must have moved far enough away from the smell, whatever it was. For a few minutes everything was fine and I had started to forget about it, but then it came back. Stronger. Like death. Rotting, stinking, foul death. I couldn't figure out how it had followed me. I looked around and saw the same things. Road, trees, grass, no rotting animals, nothing. This time I decided I'd move on a bit farther. I'd even walk until I came to the next town if I had to. As I walked, though, the smell didn't go away, and I actually started to get nervous. How could a smell be following me? I was now really wishing a car would stop and pick me up. After an hour or so, I couldn't walk anymore. I sat down and tried to relax, but all I could think about was that death smell. As it started to get dark, I still didn't see anything. I really, really wanted to get in a nice warm car and get out of there. I didn't want to spend the night in the woods at all, let alone with whatever smelled that bad. I kept looking toward the woods, and just as the sun was going below the trees, I saw two red dots, what looked like red eyes staring at me from the shadows. I jumped up, grabbed my pack, and started walking again. I didn't think I had it in me, but I was walking fast. I waved my arms wildly every time a car passed, but they probably just thought I was crazy. None of them stopped. I watched the woods as I walked, but now couldn't see anything. Finally, I stopped and sat down. I had to. I was both physically and mentally exhausted. The smell was still there, but faint enough that I thought maybe I had been imagining it. Right then, I looked over to the woods again and again saw the red dots but this time I didn't see just the eyes. I watched as this creature started to step out of the shadows. Now I could see antlers above the eyes, huge antlers like on a big old buck. And then I saw the rotting flesh hanging off the face, which was basically just a skull. The body was bones with what looked like decomposing meat hanging off it. 
It stood on its hind legs, which were like deer legs, but it was taller than a deer would be if it did that. It was huge, like nine or ten feet tall. The grinning skull was the worst, though. Because of those eyes that were looking at me like laser beams, I wanted to run, but I couldn't move. Besides, there wasn't anywhere to go. The thing had been following me all day, I was now sure of that. Now that it was out of the woods, the death smell was really strong. It made me want to vomit, and I felt so sick I wasn't sure I could move. I felt like giving up. That thing was going to come out of the woods and kill me, eat me, whatever it was going to do. It kept walking toward me slowly, grinning and dropping bits of flesh like a zombie from one of those movies. It had that blank expression like one of them too. Blank and evil at the same time. The highway lights near us suddenly went out, like just blinked off. The moon was just a little sliver, and the nearest house was so far away I couldn't even see it. It was dark. Real dark. I couldn't see the thing now at all except its red eyes. But I could smell it, and I realized it wasn't making any sound at all. I couldn't even hear it walking, even though I knew it was still coming closer to me, slowly. I pulled myself up and started to stumble toward the nearest streetlight. I knew the thing was still following me, but I didn't know how close it was. Then I heard tires on the highway. I didn't care anymore. I knew this could be my last chance of getting away, and so I stumbled out onto the highway. I saw the headlights blinding me. I wanted to lie down, give up, but I reached my arms up and the truck miraculously saw me and pulled off the road and stopped. The driver then rolled down his window, but before he could say anything, I yelled, Something's chasing me. Let me in, please. He sniffed the air for a second and said, The Wendigo. Get in, quick. And that was that. That's the story of how I feel my life was miraculously saved by a stranger. I like to consider myself a pretty sensible person. I'm never too erratic or overreacting to situations. If I'm wrong, I take accountability for my actions. So I have no reason to feed into any conspiracy-fueled nonsense. What I witnessed the summer, after I retired from 30 years of fighting wildfires, almost scared me to death. It was something straight out of the horror films my kids love to watch so much. It was always my dream after retirement to move back to my hometown, right outside Fresno, California, near the river. I wanted to feel at peace in a slightly more rural area, while still being accessible to the city. I was still near my kids, able to see them at any time I wanted. My dreams of a peaceful life, fishing in my backyard, sitting on the porch playing Sudoku in the morning, were coming true. I could finally be at ease the only fires left to fight coming from the stove after my cooking attempts, I closed on a home and started moving my things back and forth from Los Angeles. It was bittersweet, of course, as I had many friends there, who I wouldn't be right up the street from anymore. Then one day, my friend of ten years started prying into my intentions for moving. They seemed to be pressed about Fresno specifically for some reason. I wasn't sure if it was due to personal experience with people or them just not wanting me to go. After beating around the bush, they got to the point that there's an old tale of something in Fresno that was really freaky, as they put it. Again, I'm a sensible person, so when I hear of tall tales, they don't faze me much. Not even pictures can always influence my opinion since we live in a technologically advanced society. Since we've been friends for so long, I still valued their opinion and understood it must be serious if being brought up. So I listened to their story of an old spouse whose family lived around the same leak I was moving near. One morning while waiting for the school bus, he saw some crazy looking thing running full speed on all fours. At this point I was tuned out, not wanting to believe any recollection of something 30 plus years ago seen as a child. Children would say anything, I thought. The reality is children are more likely to witness supernatural beings and accept them as real because they haven't been conditioned to believe otherwise. I listened to them explain the psychological impact it had on them as a child. While empathizing, I could not see myself changing my mind about moving simply based on this. 
I understood my decision and respected it, saying they figured I would have to see it to believe it. Regardless, they helped me pack and sent me on my way. Three weeks later I moved in completely, ready to begin the rest of my life. At first it took some getting used to. I was seeking the adrenaline rush from firefighting which I missed so much. Normally a homebody, I found myself wanting to get out of the house more often. So, I started looking for new hobbies to try out. I found a painting class in town which felt perfect. Three days later I went to my first class, making a few friends right off the bat. We were assigned to do a freestyle painting session of anything of our choice. We had dividers between us to make sure every idea was original, and nobody could mistakenly feed off of each other's ideas for inspiration. We still had conversation, just not about what we were painting. I told him I was new to town, which sparked a million different conversations about the area. We talked about everything from good restaurants, good places to hike, and places to avoid. Even though we had just met, I felt that I could trust what they were saying. Their words seemed to come with wisdom and experience. Before I knew it, we had been talking for 25 minutes and it was time to share what we painted. I went first as the newbie, showing the fiery scene of a forest fire being doused with water. I told the short story of its inspiration, explaining the recent end of my career. A few people later, a younger man showed his painting of a pale naked being on all fours. Once again I was faced with another story of someone with either first-hand experience or knowing someone who had seen it. I couldn't help but start to feel a little weird at this point. Everyone couldn't be lying. I was running out of excuses to not at least be a little scared of seeing this thing. I could no longer just blame a child's imagination for it. This thing was way more common than I expected. Two weeks later, as I was sitting on the porch doing a Sudoku puzzle, something scurried through my yard. My full focus was on my puzzle book, but my peripheral still caught it. Frozen, I could not have moved if I tried. Of course, the creature was on my mind. I forced myself to stand up, trying to get a head start in case I had to run suddenly, grabbing my phone to make sure it was silent, to avoid drawing attention to myself. Then I stood there waiting to see if it would come back. I heard tapping noises, like someone chopping wood nearby or something. Then, there it was again. It zoomed across my yard so fast I could barely see it good. It was so human-like, yet no human could be physically able to move that fast on all fours. It wasn't furry or feathered like an animal, nor did it move like one. It made no sense whatsoever. Not only were its movements non-human-like, but its face looked like something out of insidious. No human has fully black eyes with no pupils. Not that I had time to overanalyze its facial features because by the time I saw the face good, I had dropped my book and ran in the house. I rented the house out immediately, moving back to Los Angeles for the time being. I told my friend what I saw and all they could say was I told you so. I know someone out there will believe me. Before I saw this for myself, I thought anyone saying they saw a creature like this was absolutely crazy or lying. A few years ago, in the springtime, we had just broken ground for a new home in rural Maine. It's what would be our vacation home, close to ski slopes, a river, and a lake where we could bring the kids fishing, maybe even ice fishing in the winter. It took about 10 minutes to get to the closest store, which is the mom-and-pop convenience store that sells gasoline, sandwiches, slushies, groceries, etc. At the time, that was the closest store if you wanted to get something to eat. Otherwise, it was a 45-minute drive to the next big town that had McDonald's, KFC, that sort of stuff. When the construction crews were starting to frame the house, I would be over there pretty much every few days to see how things were going, and I'd always bring them lunch. Usually I grabbed a few subs and sodas. Well, on this particular day when I walked into the mom and pop place, I see a sign that they were now offering fresh pizza. It already smelled amazing in there. It was still a little cool out early spring, so I thought something hot for lunch would be great. I ordered a large pepperoni and a large deluxe pizza with lots of sausage on it. I grabbed some Cokes for them, 
put the pizza on the seat of my car, and headed to the lot. When I got there, the guys were working hard. They looked up and waved, looked at their watches. It's a little early for lunch, so I just hung out for a few minutes. Then we sit in random places around the lot to eat, mostly on tailgates, and a couple of us sit on these big rocks at the edge of the lot. There is nothing but woods in every direction of the clearing. Everyone says the pizza is really good. So that's good. Right about the time we finish eating, it starts to rain, like really come down. Clouds were expected that day, but the rain is really a surprise. The foreman starts swearing and tells the guys they'll wait it out for a bit. The guys scramble to get tools out of the rain, put them in their trucks. Everyone just sits in their cars and trucks while the rain beats down. Pretty soon it's obvious that it's going to be way too wet and muddy here, so the foreman tells the guys to just wrap it up for the day. Everyone drives off and I sit there a little longer, waiting for the rain to let up because I really need to pee. But there's just no break in that rain, it's just pouring. I figure I'll just dash to the edge of the woods, pee as quick as I can, then run back. I'm instantly soaked. I trudge a few yards into the woods and stop because there's too much brush to go any further. I figure nobody is around anyway, so I unzip and pee behind a tree. As I'm finishing, I hear the sloshing sound of someone walking toward me. I turn to see who came back, thinking someone had forgotten something. But there, at the opposite side of the lot, Next to the half-framed house, there is this huge, hairy creature. Like, I'm talking Bigfoot. I'm completely not kidding, it's 100% a Bigfoot. I mean, unless it was the most realistic costume on Earth, like a Hollywood world-class makeup artist slipped into the woods of rural Maine and was then screwing with me. But I know it wasn't a costume, there's no way. And I could smell it, seriously. The strongest and most unusual smell reached me from across the lot. This creature was at least seven feet tall, and exactly the way everyone describes it. Long arms and legs. A face that is somewhat human and somewhat like a Wookiee. It had long, shaggy, dark brown hair, some of it hanging from his arms, and a huge hunk of it trailing down his back. This thing had apparently found the wet box of leftover pizza that one of the guys left behind on a rock when he dodged the rain. I know it is not a human in a costume, because then I actually see it eat, chewing loudly and completely scarfing it down like something or someone who hasn't eaten in a while. It devoured each slice quickly, and ate like, I don't know, seven slices maybe in under a minute. Then I watched as it wandered and sniffed around the lot like he was looking for more food. He found a can of Coke, sniffed it, then dropped it back on the ground. I was frozen in place half hidden behind an oak but still getting completely drenched. However, the one good thing about the downpour is that it was keeping me hidden and therefore safe. My car was in the driveway but the creature didn't seem to notice or care. It did want inside the house and stood on the new floorboards and looked around. All this time the rain is just soaking everything and I'm so scared I can't even blink. Then a rush of wind started the rain swirling in a different direction, and that's when the creature looked in my direction and just stopped with its face towards me. I think he had gotten a whiff of me. He then picked up a long board from a pile and heaved it in my direction, just missing the tree. And then he took off. He ran fast through all that impossible brush back into the woods. It was only a moment or two before I lost sight of him. I didn't go back to the lot again for about a month. I rent it out now and tell tenants not to leave food outside because it could attract bears. Anyway, that's it. Not my ideal vacation house at all anymore. My wife seems to be more in tune with the supernatural realm and has seen and felt many ghosts over the years. Anyhow, I do have one experience that still haunts me to this day, and I think about it every once in a while. It's the early 1980s, and I'm in 10th grade. I play in the concert band, and we're doing a performance at the school one evening in the late fall. It all goes well, and I'm walking home by myself afterwards. I would say it's around 10 in the evening. The town that I grew up in has a bunch of walking paths. It's dark out, but the paths are well lit and perfectly safe. 
I was not on high alert at all, just happily moseying my way home like any other day. I'm almost home. Just one more gradual slope up a hill, over the bridge, turn right, and I'm there. I reach the beginning of the long uphill slope to the bridge, and I look up and stop dead in my tracks with an eerie sense of dread. It takes a few seconds to process why. There is a man standing at the top of the hill, probably 50 yards away just before the where the bridge starts, and he's looking at me. It's not unusual to see other people along this path. It's fairly well traveled during the day, but it's night and there's no one else around, just me and this guy. Then I realize what made me stop so suddenly. I can only see his silhouette as the lights from the road behind him outline his shape. But he's standing there, akimbo, hands on his hips, and he's wearing a top hat. So all of this takes about a second to process, and I realize I'm just standing there at the base of the hill looking up at him. I can sense something that can only be described as pure evil. I know he's looking right at me, and for a brief moment I'm paralyzed. I can feel him looking at me. My rational brain takes over, and I'm able to step off the path and move behind some trees that block his view of me. I quickly go through my options. Keep walking up the path because obviously my mind is playing tricks. Either I saw something that wasn't there or it's just some guy walking his dog, right? Okay, so I slowly peek out from behind the tree and there he is. In the exact same spot, in the exact same stance. Still looking directly at me and still wearing that top hat. Oh, and did I mention the sense of pure evil piercing through my very core? Yep, still there. Option two, run. Which is what I did. To this day, I still regret running away. It bothers me that I'll never know exactly who or what that was waiting for me at the top of the hill, right before the bridge. Did it really happen? In my mind, absolutely. But I can't be sure. If it happened today, I would run up the hill towards him just so I could find out what it really was. If I ever see him again, I will. But it's been over 30 years and still no sign of him.